We have breaking news to report. You see there live pictures coming in from Jerusalem there in northern Israel by the Lebanese border and southern Israel by the Gazan border there. Right now, we are getting word. I want to put up this tweet here from Trey Yanks that as we speak right now, U.S. and U.K. airstrikes are targeting Houthi positions in Yemen. Uh, we want to bring into the conversation right now retired Marine intelligence officer and national security analyst, our friend Hal Kemper. Hal joins me. Uh, Hal, good to see you. All right, so it's finally happening. We have been talking about this, what, for the last week on whether or not U.S. forces we're going to do something to this effect. And from reports right now, they are doing just that. What more do we know? What have you heard, Hal? Uh, Andrew, we have the most breaking news right now. Uh, there is a, really isn't much more out there than the fact the airstrikes are going on. I would point out it's night, uh, so there's, it's very difficult to see what's out there. There really aren't uh, any media outlets that would be floating off the coast of Yemen that could see where they're earning strikes along the shoreline or something. So uh, the best we're probably going to get is maybe some satellite imagery, but that's going to take time to see where the strikes are taking place. What I do expect, though, is that Great Britain and the U.S. will probably provide some video to show some of these strike missions. Uh, it, it was it was pretty much inevitable it's going to happen. Uh, as you know, earlier today, the British Prime Minister uh, formally announced that he had authorized uh, British forces to strike Houthi positions in Yemen. Uh, when you have an announcement like that, that's pretty much as big a green light as you're ever going to see from Great Britain. And certainly Great Britain's not going to do that unless they're you know, doing that alongside the U.S. as part of the task force command structure. So it, it pretty much implied that the U.S. and the U.K. were about to do this. Also, the U.N., which has played an interesting role throughout the entire conflict, you know, to say the least, gave what it called its last and final warning to the Houthis, which I thought was kind of an interesting choice of words coming from the United Nations, uh, saying that this was after the U.S. and its allies had also given its last and final warning to the Houthis, basically saying stop attacking uh, shipping in the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb. Okay. With all that said... Everything was pointing towards uh, there are going to be strikes at Houthi positions. And where those will probably be is uh, those locations where they have seen drones being launched, where they have seen missiles being launched. Uh, it will probably be much more directed towards those, although I wouldn't rule out uh, command and control nodes as well. That's also a very likely thing uh, that we may see. And that opens up a, a different array of possible targets that could be hit. I guess, uh, Mihal, maybe it's too early to tell, but do you think Houthi rebels uh, will be cowed by this in any form, or will they be emboldened? Uh, will they take this as some type of provocation where they'll just ramp up their attacks on you know, vessels uh, and maritime travel there in the Red Sea and elsewhere? Or, or will this send the message that U.S. and U.K. forces want it to send, do you think? Well, I think rhetorically, they're going to be very bold and audacious and make statements. They have already made statements. They said, if you attack us, we will really attack you. And and I kind of look at the array of what they have, and, and I, my first thought was, uh, attack us with what? What more are you going to attack us with that you haven't attacked us with so far? They have a lot of missiles. They have a lot of drones. But they, like anyone else, have a limited inventory. And they've been and, – and when they got the last and final warning – uh, the response was to send about 20 missiles and drones uh, going out to sea, some of which were targeting uh, U.S. Navy warships. And I thought that was pretty clear. Uh, really, what I think is we're going to watch their actions. Uh, I think the, the truth of the matter will be in what they do less than what they say. You know, if we suddenly see a slew of drones and uh, missiles coming out to uh, hit shipping, uh, then I think that's going to be uh, the response. Uh, I think whatever they say uh, is secondary compared to what they actually do. On the other hand, we have had, as a, we and the Brits and our other allies have had a lot of time to work through the target intelligence to figure out where we want to hit. And of course, uh, like any other strike, it's not just making a statement. You're, you're trying to degrade uh, your opponent's capabilities. And we'll see how successful that degradation is in terms of how it will actually prevent 
further strikes or diminish further strikes right. simply because they hit the right places. Yeah, and uh, we did have the Pentagon press briefing today. Uh, this was kind of a key feature of some of the line of questioning from reporters there uh, to the Pentagon press secretary, Major General Patrick Ryder as well. Hal, what does this mean? And Hal, I just want to kind of set the, the, the tone here for the viewers who are just joining. Um, this is happening right now. I, I mean, it couldn't be yes. any perfect timing for, for you coming on, but U.S. and U.K. forces, according to reports, are striking, we don't know how many, um, Houthi targets inside of Yemen. Hell, you hear time and time again uh, about some of the criticisms that this Israel-Hamas war um, will spill over into a wider regional conflict, especially many here who are critical of it, uh, are saying that the U.S. might have to get involved. This is now a kinetic war. Do you think that um, criticism now is valid, that we are involved in a way that we were not before this was all happening? Of course, we've sent some of these aircraft uh, carrier strike groups there into the Mediterranean to kind of deter Hezbollah. But we're striking forces inside a sovereign country as we speak right now. What are we to make of that? How do we interpret our role now in all of this? Well, our, our role is now uh, we're an active participant, if you will, before we we're deterrence. I mean, we we're okay. basically deterring uh, Hezbollah from attacking from the north because of our our, uh, our carrier sitting off the coast. But now we're actually uh, engaged in combat operations. One could argue, though, uh, because of what was happening before with taking out missiles and drones in the Red Sea, and certainly because of our strikes in Iraq and Syria, particularly our most recent strike, uh, up in Iraq, uh, which uh, was, you know, basically a very targeted operation where they we tracked, uh, uh, basically, uh, we tracked a target and then took them out with a drone. That's the sort of thing that, that said we're creeping more towards that. Now, I can't say any better than, than uh, uh, recently retired General uh, McKenzie, the former CENTCOM commander, uh, said yesterday. You know, he was trying to explain the sort of weighted way that we assess what the Iranians will do. And in his uh, estimation, he didn't see the Iranians um, initiating a full-scale war or really entering into this. And, and there's a lot of stuff that he intuitively understands because of his position in the region. But, but basically, this I wouldn't say this is opening the door wide open for a wider conflict. What this is doing, though, it's addressing a huge threat that affects the entire globe, which is yeah. they have shut off the uh, the waterway that moves 15% of global trade. Yeah. This is one of the most important waterways, one of the most important channels in the world. The Suez Canal's um, uh, traffic is down uh, more than 30%. I, I hear it's actually much less or much more than 30%, the, the diminishment of, of a, a movement of ships through there. You have major shipping lines that have said we can't move our ships through there. You have uh, tankers, uh, LNG especially, but also diesel and regular oil that are going around the Horn of Africa to avoid um, this uh, going through the Bob Mendev Strait. Uh, that's just not a sustainable situation. Yeah, you know, so Hal, even if it widens the war, something had to be done. I see. Hal, uh, I want to get your thoughts too, because there was some reporting to suggest um, that President Biden was going to make some type of statement uh, about all of this tonight. That's no longer on the table. We'll see whether or not uh, he makes a statement sometime tomorrow on camera or whether or not the White House um, or U.S. CENTCOM or the Pentagon might issue a statement later tonight uh, because reports are coming in that this is happening right now. Um, that airstrikes are being conducted against Houthi targets inside of Yemen. Hal, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up. Uh, we know that Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is still in the hospital right now, recovering. Um, and we got this news today from the um, Inspector General there at the Pentagon uh, saying this, that they will review the hospitalization notification procedures. The Inspector General there at the Defense Department saying this, the objective of the review is to examine the roles, processes, procedures, responsibilities, and actions related to the Secretary of Defense's hospitalization in December and January and assess whether the DOD's policies and procedures are sufficient to ensure timely and appropriate notifications and the effective transition of authorities as may be warranted due to health-based or other unavailability of senior leadership. All right, Hal, 
This had to be approved, of course, by President Biden to give the green light for these airstrikes to take place. Secretary of Defense, Biden's Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, is in a hospital room right now as we speak. Uh, yes, he has assumed his full roles and responsibilities. Um, but if that were not the case here, if Austin was still you know, in the ICU recovering, uh, if Kathleen Hicks was his deputy, she was assuming the full roles as well, would this have all looked different? Uh, when you take the Austin scandal and put it up with what we know is happening right now, what do you make of that? Uh, I, I guess, thankfully, yes, he has assumed full role and responsibility there still as Secretary of Defense. But if this were to happen, have happened three, four, five days ago, it would have been a much different picture, would it not have? Yeah, I, I think it would have been a little more complicated uh, to a certain degree, although I have no doubt that Kathleen Hicks uh, could have stepped up and uh, fulfilled that role. I don't think there would have been a problem there. Uh, there is a problem with notifications. I would point out a, a problem with that investigation. The Office of Inspector General uh, for the Pentagon reports to the Secretary of Defense. I, I know that we'd love to say that there's perfect integrity uh, in all government agencies and organizations, but at the end of the day, you have the Secretary of Defense essentially ordering his own investigative agency to investigate him. Okay. I don't think that's going to be satisfactory to everybody on Capitol Hill. I'm, I'm not even sure if that's going to be completely satisfactory to everybody in the White House. I think you're going to have to have some sort of outside, uh, neutral investigative organization take a look at this entire, entire episode of what happened, uh, and certainly not one that, that reports directly to the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, even if it's the the best, you know, most objective investigation in the world, it will still raise eyebrows just because of how the OIG is structured, or the IG, I should say, is structured within the Department of Defense. That's just that's just simple reality. That I is see. the chain of command. And yeah. uh, so that's going to be a little bit of a challenge there. Uh, one thing I would point out is that the, uh, co the uh, combatant commanders, the COCOM, or what we call the COCOM commanders, are... Uh, Basically, they report directly to the commander in chief. Um, they don't, you know, they, they usually will go through the secretary of defense. Usually the secretary of defense is a big part of whatever they do on something like this. But nothing really gets between the commander of U.S. Central Command and uh, and the president of the United States. I, I mean, bottom line is, you know, one can say chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Joint Chiefs play a role in that. And yes, they do. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the, the, you know, if I was a U.S. Central Command commander uh, and you asked me, what's my chain of command, I, I would probably say the president of the United States. That's okay. just kind of how it works. That's yeah. why they are a unified commander. Yeah. And of course, a lot of people there in this apparatus make recommendations to the president. Uh, president Obama is mm -hmm. the one to ultimately give the green light on this. And I don't want to speculate at all here. I was just saying, you know, could you have envisioned a scenario where maybe President Biden wanted to do this five or six days ago? Uh, maybe he couldn't because of Secretary of Defense Austin's incapacity, uh, what have you. And I'm purely speculating here that we have no reporting to suggest that, but could you have seen a scenario or a situation where that could have been a major obstacle to carrying out these strikes we're seeing right now, or no? I, I would say uh, the scenario I could have seen is he wants to counsel of okay. his uh, Secretary of Defense. He wants to really uh, talk this through. I mean, that's part of the decision-making process. And of course, the uh, SecDef wasn't available because he was incapacitated. That is, that, that's a realistic thing to uh, discuss. That, that may have actually, that could have very well been the situation that he wanted to discuss this with him and he couldn't find him. But, but I will say this, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, there's a lot going on in the United States right now. And I don't think the president's uh, itinerary is short of things to do. Sure. So I, I, I know the fact that he didn't find out till Thursday, that may be a, an indication of the, let's just say the demand curve, which was the president didn't need to talk to him that soon. Oh, I see. Just because he felt like he was getting enough counsel. You got to remember, uh, Jake Sullivan is up there. Others right. are up there who are talking to him all the time. And, uh, and so... It's not like he's short of, of inputs. It's not. He's definitely not short of intelligence. Um, uh, the president of the United States gets the best intelligence of any leader in the world. Right. 
and he gets it every single day. So, um, so I don't. It's 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 interesting speculation. I haven't seen any indication that that was the case, though. Okay, I, I want to put this up here for viewers who are just joining us now. We're a little bit after the top of the hour. Reuters putting out this tweet there. The U.S. and Britain have started carrying out strikes against targets linked to Houthis in Yemen. According to four U.S. officials, the first time strikes have been launched against the Iran-backed group since it started targeting shipping in the Red Sea here. Hal, um, you know, we'll wait for the relevant kind of entities to describe all of this um, before they do that. Uh, what do you think some of these targets include here? They're in Yemen. I, I think what you're looking at, and it's going to be an interesting array, you know, some of these drones uh, can get launched from some very small expeditionary airfields. Uh, there are drones. I don't know if they're using those drones that you can launch without an airfield at all. There's uh, various catapult devices that can be used to put drones in the air. Uh, it usually gets into some recovery issues, uh, depending on how you want to get them back. But uh, so um, it may or may not include larger airfields, depending on how these things were launched. Uh, the missile launchers uh, are not reliant on airfields at all. And what I think you're going to see is they're going to be aiming at wherever the missiles were launched, uh, wherever the, uh, the, the drones themselves were launched, if those targets present themselves. Uh, there is a possibility that these, you know, many of these systems may be mobile. Uh, hence, there may not really be much to hit, in which case they're going to go after wherever they're stored. So they're going to hit those logistics areas. Uh, where do they keep the missiles? Uh, where do they keep the uh, drones? Uh, anything that 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 feeds into the Houthi uh, target intelligence uh, system, uh, radars, uh, maybe even coastal observation posts, whatever the Houthis are using to identify ships at sea, uh, we'd certainly like to take those out and, if, if nothing else, kind of blind the Houthis so they can't see what's moving in the Red Sea, certainly over the horizon. Okay. Uh, so those are all things we want to hit. And then I think, uh, based on what uh, everything's being said, and I have nothing – Nothing I can point to specifically, but it is kind of the way we do things. Uh, command, control, and communications. Those are, are typically high on the list of things to take out. Um, although I would not rule out that they may go for some higher profile targets. Oh. Uh, when I say command and control, uh, we have in the past aimed at very high up in the command structure, I see. Uh, sometimes to political leadership. So that's not oh. impossible. I don't know if we're going to do that. But again, I'm not looking at the classified feeds sure. and I'm not sitting in the room and I'm not having that discussion. So I can't tell you. And, and, there's, and by the way, when you do that, it is a very dynamic back and forth discussion okay. because of all the potential implications of whatever it is. These are not easily arrived at decisions. Yeah. Um decapitating the political leadership of the Houthis, uh, that would definitely send uh, a message uh, nonetheless. Hal, I, I got to talk about the wider implications of this. We're still in it right now, but Yemen is Saudi Arabia's southern neighbor. They share a border. Um, Saudi Arabia did not want the United States to do this, I think. Maybe you can fill our viewers in briefly, but Yemen and Saudi Arabia have fought a pretty nasty war over the last eight, nine years. Uh, they finally reached a truce very recently here. Saudi Arabia was very, very hesitant and reluctant for this because of how fragile that truce is. Is that in jeopardy tonight? Uh, maybe. Okay. Uh, I, would, I would think that it might be. I would also think that whatever we're doing tonight was probably a topic of conversation when uh, Secretary Blinken was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, I don't see a situation where we'd ever be blindsiding uh, the Saudis on what we're doing in this. Uh, in fact, I think we're working extremely close with them at every step of the way. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if those last and final warnings were things that were coordinated. The language was coordinated with the Saudis to some degree, or at least letting them know that this is where they're at. Saudi Arabia, like every other country in there, realizes that, that it's an impossible situation to let the Houthis uh, basically bottle up the Red Sea and 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 stop access yeah. to and from the uh, Suez Canal, okay. they they realize the situation's changed. So um, it may the truce may break down, but I got to tell you, there's no love lost between the Houthis and the Saudis. Sure. Okay, they were looking at real politic stuff in the region, and when they were saying that, 
That was the situation then. Okay. This is the situation now. All right. Uh, Hal, to your point about what may a Houthi response look like, I want to put up this quote there from one of these senior Houthi commanders uh, in Al Jazeera saying this, any American attack will not remain without a response. The response will be greater than the attack that was carried out with 20 drones and a number of missiles. This is Abdel Malik Al Houthi. Uh, he said that in a televised speech. Uh, we are more determined, he said, to target ships linked to Israel and we will not back down from that. This was what? Before the new year, Hal, when President Biden had come out and said, this is what we might do against the Houthis. Uh, this was Abdel Malik Al Houthi's response to that. And the attacks have commenced ever since. Uh, and so we'll see whether or not there's going to be some type of degradation in the attacks or diminishment in the attacks after tonight. Um, so we just have to wait and see. There's a lot of unknowns still um, at this point. All we know is that according to reports, uh, from Fox, from Reuters, the Associated Press, and, and others, um, that these um, targeted airstrikes are happening right now. Uh, and so we don't know how long they're going to last. We don't know how many targets are going to be struck. Uh, and we don't know how many Houthi rebels are going to be killed here. Now, Hal, my other question is, remember, uh, at the very outset of the Biden administration, the Houthi rebels were taken off of the FTO list, that's the Foreign Terrorist Organization designation list as well. We're striking them in Yemen tonight. Are they going to be put back on the list? Don't you have to have both here? That would you don't seem have, to have, you don't have, to have that both, would, but logically it would seem to, to track, wouldn't it? You, you, you bring up a great point. Uh, absolutely. I would imagine that they're going on the FTO list pretty soon. All right. Uh, my understanding was they were already in the process of uh, kind of reversing that decision. I hadn't seen it had been formally announced, and uh, to my knowledge, it has not been formally made. I don't know why. I don't know what was uh, so difficult about reversing that decision. Uh, but, yeah, they don't have to be designated as a foreign terrorist organization, although uh, under international law, uh, there are some things that do make strikes of this kind a little bit easier. However, the thing is, the Houthis have been launching these strikes against uh, civilian maritime shipping, against other ships uh, throughout the area. You know, and don't forget, they also shot down a U.S. drone way back when. That's right. Uh, so there's a, a number of things they've been doing. So with all that said, there's plenty of, of reason, uh, if you will, I'm going to use the word justification for, for our striking back. And the fact that the United Nations... Which is, which is not the most unified body, as you know, on a number of things, that they would come out and uh, issue the last and final warning with language very similar to what we just said the, the, uh, a few days before, which that in itself is a whole discussion, but um, that they put that out. I think that gives us enough uh, justification, uh, rationale, if you will, certainly under international law to do what we're going to do. I, I would point out, though, this kind of goes back to the earlier thing. You know, we've, you know, they, you know, a Houthi says, we fired 20 drones and missiles at you. Typical Houthi rhetoric, by the way. Um, but, uh, but with that said, um, we would like to have this end up with a situation where they can't fire 20 missiles and drones. All right. So that's part of the targeting thinking that goes into whatever we're doing. I don't know if we have that strike capability. You know, the USS Eisenhower is out there. The British have a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to do anything out of Djibouti. Uh, oh, that's okay. our big base. Uh, it's on the. It's right across the water, literally from Yemen. Uh, I, I don't know if we're going to do anything out of there. I don't know if the Djiboutians would want us to do anything out of there. There might be a, a, a reason that they would say, you will not do strike missions like this out of here. Uh, but, but with that, uh, it, it, it's a possibility. And, and, and one of the things that's kind of interesting is, and, and it's a very interesting place to be because we have our big U.S. base there. And then literally right down the way is one is the only Chinese overseas military base, which is very unusual that China and the U.S. would have military bases in the same place. But we do. Uh, I would point to a, a few days ago when Costco, the uh, the big Chinese uh, you know maritime carrier, uh, I think the biggest Chinese maritime carrier, uh, announced that it would not be sending its ships through the Red Sea because of the threat of uh, Houthi rebel strikes. I thought that was very interesting. You know, when Costco made that decision, that that's fascinating, particularly when you consider 
that that Iran and China uh, have a, a rather close relationship. Uh, it wasn't it was a few years, a couple of years ago, I believe, that that China announced uh, about a year and a half ago, China announced is making a huge investment uh, in terms of Belt and Road uh, initiative uh, activities into Iran. And so with that said, I just find that uh, rather interesting that Costco said, nope, we're not going in there. And that's just a, a real a, a real world decision. Um, certainly not uh, an ideological one or a political one per se. That's more of a real world. We're not sending our ships in because we're not sure the Houthis won't try and target us, uh, which could be targeting by mistake. But uh, uh, at least sure. that would be a Chinese perspective on it. So I find sure. that interesting, that is. which goes back to Djibouti, which is maybe the Chinese are saying, Okay, we've lost control of this situation, or if they ever had control of it, they may be saying quietly, very diplomatically, yeah, we all agree, something's got to be done. I haven't heard anything to that effect, but that is a reasonable inference based on how things are rolling out. Of course, the Chinese perspective will have to monitor as well. Also, the Iranian response, uh, what they say after all of this, that's kind of what I'll be looking out for as well. I want to put up this tweet here. We're getting some more reporting from our friends there at Politico. Lara Seligman, who covers the Defense Department so closely, saying this. The U.S. and U.K., with support from Australia, the Netherlands, Bahrain, and Canada, conducted joint strikes tonight against Houthi targets in Yemen. That's according to a DOD official who said that to Lara. Uh, and the strikes involved U.S. aircrafts, ships, and submarines, Hal. So not just airstrikes here. Isn't that interesting? It, well, the submarines would probably be launching missiles. The ships would probably be launching missiles too. But here's something, and we don't see that as much these days. This kind of harkens back to another era. Depending on the anti-ship missile threat, depending on uh, uh, how they've degraded and shaped the battle space, if you will, there's a possibility that the ships could potentially, uh, in certain areas, possibly getting close enough to employ naval gunfire. And, uh, and that really harkens back to another era, uh, if you remember the big ships with the big guns. Now, our ships today don't have uh, as much uh, naval guns or as much in the way of naval guns as they used to. Uh, we certainly don't have battleships with their 16-inch guns anymore. And the ships we have tend to be more focused on, on missile strikes uh, than, uh, than, than using their you know, they're, they're five-inch deck guns uh, to do stuff. But it is a possibility. And uh, and I can tell you, if I was a captain of one of those ships and, and that was within the scope of what we could do, um, I might look at a way that I could do it. Within reason, I don't want to put my ship at undue risk because of it. But, uh, uh, but that is a possibility of one of the ways that they can be employed. The reason I bring that up is because if they get close enough to use the naval guns, they could put in a volume of fire on certain targets where they would be uh, relatively assured that they had achieved whatever goals or end state they were hoping okay. on that particular target set. All right. Hal Kemper, we got to leave it at that. Uh, I think we'll be relying on your expertise a lot over the next couple of days here, and we have to wait and see uh, official statements. Maybe they will come in tonight from the Pentagon, CENTCOM, the White House, who knows, um, but this is a very you know, active, uh, developing, fluid situation there uh, in the Middle East. Hal, can't thank you enough. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Andrew. All right. Uh, in the meantime, let's keep it moving here. Of course, my colleagues throughout the night, Karel Lahara and Austin Westfall, will also be providing updates uh, on this ongoing situation there uh, in Yemen uh, as some of these Houthi targets are being struck as we speak by a coalition of allies, partners, and forces from the U.S., the U.K., Canada, Australia as well. Live now, look there uh, in London, foggy London town at nighttime there, the London skyline. Uh, we also uh, are continuing to get more details. I uh, want to pull up the AP filing here from our friend Josh Breslow. He tweeted out this um, from the Associated Press that the U.S. and British militaries were bombing more than a dozen sites used by the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen today. It's a massive retaliatory strike using warship-launched Tomahawk missiles and fighter jets. Uh, so uh, that's quite interesting as well. Uh, we're getting so many more details into this wider picture. Uh, let's just take a quick commercial break.